So uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, to speak in this webinar today. Um, I haven't got any disclosures to make or conflict of interest. Uh, so my name is Mohammed Abdul Ghadir. I'm a cardiology registrar working at Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Gateshead in London, in the in um, UK. And today's session is going to be about aortic stenosis. So uh, this session is uh, going to start with a case presentation that is divided into two parts. Uh, it will also include some guidelines, mainly from the European Society of Cardiology. Uh, it will also include some uh, studies and end with a, a few take-home messages. Um, so this uh, session is aimed toward being an interactive uh, session. So if you have any questions or comments at any point, uh, please do stop me and we can take it from there on. Uh, so starting with the case presentation, it was a 75-year-old female with a background of uh, previous uh, NSTEMI, where she had PC high to OM1. She's hypertensive with an insulin-dependent diabetes uh, with chronic kidney disease. She lives alone and she's needing family support and she's got a Rockwood frailty score between three and four, which is a frailty score that is commonly used for the people who are not familiar with it's a frailty score that is commonly used in the UK. She was admitted after a collapse uh, where she had exertion of sort of breath, but she denied any chest pain of note. So going further, she was uh, admitted to the care of the elderly ward. Uh, she was referred to the cardiology team, having positive troponin and then uh, some ECG changes. On examination, uh, she was eovolemic. Uh, she had a blood pressure of um, 106 systolic. She had an ejection systolic murmur. Uh, she has a heart rate of 78 and a spirit rate of 16. Uh, and that was an ECG. Um, if someone who can comment or run a commentary on the changes on this ECG, uh, any of the faculty. Yes, uh, thank you, Mohammed. Uh, this is Abu Bakr Khalil. So I'm just trying to zoom into it. So sinus rhythm ECG with, uh, um, not sure. So quite the left bundle branch block or partial left bundle branch block. I can't measure the exact duration of TRS, but it doesn't look too prolonged in some views. There are some strain patterns. There are ST elevation if this is left bundle. Sometimes you expect, expect these changes. And there are lateral ST depression and V5 and V6 which could also be a left ventricular strain or hypertrophy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Walker. So indeed, uh, this patient has a left axis deviation and uh, what could look like an incomplete left bundle branch block. Uh, and uh, arguably, uh, there is ST sloping or reverse stick sign in the lateral leads with ST elevation in the uh, anterior leads and uh, uh, positive voltage criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy. So um, I'll, I'll convince you that this uh, ECG is quite typical of, uh, of a left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, so she had further investigation uh, where she had uh, uh, hemoglobin of 110, uh, citroponins was, was 53 and 52 respectively. It was raised, but there was no dynamic uh, rise. She had the keratin of 160 and she had an x-ray which was reported as being unremarkable. Uh, that, was an, that was her echo. I'm sorry that it might not project uh, perfectly, but I was wondering if someone can take the initiative of, uh, of commenting on this echo. I'll, pl I'll play it again and tell me if, uh, if you want me to do anything otherwise. Any of the panel? Or... Okay, and I think if they don't volunteer, I will go for it. So as we can see clearly from the, sorry. It's okay, so okay. go ahead, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Salam 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 go ahead, go ahead. Thanks, Dr. Abdurrahman. I think we'd like to extend our welcome to you. And just I will uh, try my best. So uh, as we can see, there is a short axis, uh, uh, a long short axis view. As you can see here, I think it's clearly the aortic valve is uh, tri left -lit. And as we can see, there's a very extensive calcifications. On here, on five camber view, uh, Bristol, uh, sorry, uh, evical five camber view. I think, uh, would you please, Mohammed, just play the video, yeah? 
Yeah. I think it's uh, see clearly. I think there's a restriction of the valve opening and very heavy calcifications. And I think uh, from the ECG finding, from the history we just heard now, lady with collapse, and I think this is finding giving with a significant aortic stenosis. And just over to Dr. Abdurrahman if you want to add anything. Yeah, just uh, thank you, Abdul Azim. Thank you, Mohammed Bin Gadir. Assalamu alaikum, uh, our dear colleagues. Uh, it's my pleasure to be with you in this webinar. So uh, the only comment I have on the five chamber view we see here, if you can see the case, just uh, Muhammad Abdelgad, please just uh, point to this one, the first image on your left side, the top left. So in the, in the five chamber view, uh, we would like always the image to be vertical, as vertical as you can because of the alignment. If you, if you notice here, the alignment uh, towards uh, horizontal. So this will clearly underestimate the, uh, the gradient because the gradient here equals the cosine of angle theta uh, times the gradient, whatever gradient you get. So uh, the angle theta should be between zero to 20 uh, maximum degrees. And here, uh, I guess it is more than 20. So, we expect that uh, the, the gradient will be underestimated a little bit. Other than that, uh, as Dr. Azim said, it's very uh, correct. It's trileaflet, heavily calcified, aortic valve. Although here looks like opening well, reasonably, but the, the problem is maybe the maximum stenosis at the tips, not at the, I mean, the base. So what we see, we don't know where the technician or the one who did the echo where, where she cuts the aortic valve, the short axis. Uh, so if we want to be sure that we are the tips, we should do X-plane or biplane uh, and to put our cursor exactly as the tips. Uh, only in this situation, we will be sure that we cut that uh, aortic valve at the tips and then we can even freeze it and in the astole and we see the maximum opening, and we can trace it to do planning it. Uh, thank you. And we should show also the, I mean, the uh, short axis and parasternal long axis to see the degree of LVH by echo. We saw it by ECG very clearly, but it's important to see also the cavity, whether, whether, whether it is a small cavity, because this also will give us like low, low gradient, uh, paradoxical air. Uh, I mean the AS. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jamil. Um, it was a very nice uh, run through uh, this echo, especially coming from an expert like yourself. Uh, it was uh, such a shame that I had only limited access to the echoes that she had, but uh, hopefully I might convince you that uh, she was having an aortic valve area of 0.7 with a peak velocity of 3.7 meters per second and a mean gradient of 36 millimeters of mercury. And uh, as you correctly said, uh, measuring the L LV diameter and the LV, LV wall is quite important. So she did have LVH uh, with a normal ejection fraction. So uh, going to the classification of AS severity, I think most uh, guidelines as the ESC and AHA and ACC guidance do agree uh, in terms of classification of aortic disease into moderate, mild, and severe, with an aortic jet velocity of more than four meters per second being severe, with a mean gradient of more than 40 and aortic valve area of less than one. So, uh, so what's next? So any idea from the panel or any of the team who wants to comment? So what should we do next for this lady? Probably as uh, this is Abu Bakr Khalil again, uh, thank you for this uh, data and reminding us of the uh, uh, guideline, uh, guideline classifications of severity. Um, as as uh, my colleague, mashallah, Dr. Abdurrahman Jameel has pointed out, this might be an underestimated gradient um, and you probably would want to have a further assessment. Uh, with regard to further assessment, you could probably try to align it on a transthoracic echo to get a, a more accurate gradient, or you could move on to, to, to different levels. Uh, CT calcium scoring has been increasingly useful in determining the amount of calcification and determining the severity, but you may want to ask someone expert in that particular field, or you may want to do a stress echo 
to see if the gradient increases. By the aortic valve area itself, this is significant. But by itself, if you take it individually, you may not be able to convince a surgeon or a TAVI operator to, to operate on this, on, on this patient. Uh, yesterday I had a similar case, a 94-year-old, uh, which we have done a TOE assessment because the views, the transverse views weren't easy. And uh, we had to use dual lumen uh, Langston catheter to, to get an accurate mean gradient and peak gradient continuously. Um, I would probably move on from here with a dobutamine stress echo if the team are not convinced this is uh, severe aortic stenosis. Thank you very much, Dr. Becker. And as you've rightly said, there was a discrepancy. So uh, let's talk about aortic stenosis then and see what the guidelines say. So um, as we know from previous trials and observation studies, uh, valvular heart disease is more common in the elderly population. And as you can see, uh, there is an apparent correlation between valvular heart disease and increase in age. And we can say there is a one to eight ratio of patients who are above people or actually above age of 75 years, having either moderate or, or, or severe valvular heart disease. 3% uh, of patients above the age of 75 uh, have uh, aortic stenosis. Um, and we know in developed countries, Europe and North America, it's the most common valvular disease requiring an intervention. The prevalence of aortic stenosis increased with age. So uh, at, uh, it's 1% at 65, uh, at 65 years. It jumps to 2% at 75 and even jumps further to 4% at 85. So there is a different correlation between the incidence of aortic stenosis and age. Uh, so aortic stenosis usually runs an asymptomatic latent period, uh, which can be a decade or two, so it, it's a matter of 10 to 20 years, during which the LV outflow obstruction and pressure load on the myocardium gradually increases. Symptoms develop gradually, um, with, the, with the initial symptoms being exertional dyspnea being the most common initial complaint, uh, even in patients with normal LV function. For instance, in our lady, she had an ejection of fraction of 55, but we believe that she was symptomatic. Uh, eventually, you get the three cardinal signs of uh, chest, chest pain, syncope, and heart failure. And uh, respectively, they carry poor prognosis with heart failure, having worse prognosis. So uh, patients who have symptoms have an average survival rate of 50% at two years and only 20% of five years if left untreated. So we know that once symptoms appear, you have a poor prognosis. So uh, this is a study uh, made by Robert Zilberzak, published in the Cardiovascular Journal um, in 2017. It was aimed toward assessing the natural history and optimal timing of surgery in elderly population with severe asymptomatic aortic stenosis. Uh, it had a median uh, follow-up of uh, more than 19 months, during which they had 91 events in the 103 patients. So as you can see over here, they assessed event-free survival. And when we say event, an event is classed as, a, as an indication for surgery, as in valvular replacement, or hospitalization due to heart failure related to valvular, valvular disease. So what we have, we had nine indications uh, we had 91 events that was observed, out of which 82 were indication for surgery and nine were cardiac death related to valvular disease. And it was only surgery rather than TAVI. And we're going to come to, back to that later. So if you plot a line between these two lines, you can see that at, uh, at one year, there was 71% incidence, uh, free incidence. And at, at two years, it was 43 event-free event -free survival rate. At three years, it went down to 23. And at four years, it was around 16. And as you can see from this first slide, from this first graph, there was a significant difference in terms of velocity. So what they have said and concluded is that peak velocity was an isolated predictor for outcome. So what we think is that if you have higher velocity, then you have significantly higher chance of getting uh, events within the follow-up period, and they had a p-value of 0 0.001, so that was significant. In the second, in the second graph, 
you can see that patients who had with patients who had worse symptoms and that was plotted mainly against heart failure which we know has poorer prognosis they do worse even postoperatively so patients who presented with severe onset symptoms or they have worse symptoms they do worse respectively and it has a p value of 0 0.002 so they concluded that in elderly patients with severe but asymptomatic as mild symptoms might be difficult to detect uh, and they've they've warranted that to patients having impaired mobility or frailty um, and they they said warranting clinical close clinical outcome is quite important Furthermore, a very high event rate can be expected and cardiac death is infrequent. Um, and, they, and they proposed elective aortic valve could be considered at low patient risk, which is unfortunately not very common. Um, there is a few limitations to this study. Uh, first of all, I would say it was conducted between 99 and 2009, and that was before TAVI error, as a lot of these patients would have been uh, referred for TAVI rather than surgical AVR. And it was also not clear from the methodology as to how many patients had treadmill test, which in case it was positive, it would have been an indication for referral as well. So going back to cause of AS, so as we would all know, bicuspid aortic valve is common, especially in the younger population. Degenerative calcified aortic stenosis, more common in the elderly. Post-traumatic calcified AS, main, mainly in patients in the developing countries and sub and supravalvular obstructions. So uh, I'm gonna speak briefly about bicuspid aortic valve. And the reason being is that it's the most common congenital cardiac abnormality and it's affecting approximately one to 2% of the general population. We know it's a familial disease and it's got variable inheritance. It's got a 10% chance of a first degree relative being affected and a 20 to 30% chance when aortopathy is included and it's been associated with a notch one gene mutation. So when it comes to classification of uh, aort bicuspid aortic valve, so a type one bicuspid aortic valve has got an AP commissure that divides into left and right cusp, while in type two, you get fusion of the left coronary and non-coronary cusp. So uh, for non-cardiologists or the general population. So a left coronary cusp is the one that drives the left coronary artery and right coronary is where you get right coronary artery. A non-coronary uh, non -coronary cusp is the one that drives no artery. So we know for, that type one has higher chances to, due to stenosis, while type two will develop complications earlier. Sometimes you can get a ridge or raffi as we call, uh, and that sometimes in a transthoracic echo uh, can, can deceive you, making it look like a tri-leaflet. Uh, valve. So with regards to complication, I'm going to whisk through quickly through complications because I think that is important, especially in assessing patients with bicuspid aortic valve. As we know, aortic stenosis is very common. And as a matter of fact, a lot of people uh, need surgery at mid-age. And only 15% of patients with bicuspid aortic valve have normal function of the valve in the fifth decade. So a lot of these patients will end up having surgeries. Aortic regurg is a complication, as well as endocarditis, aortic aneurysm, and palpitation of the aorta. Aortic aneurysm might lead to rupture and dissection. And um, from previous observation of studies, there is a nine-fold increase in risk of aortic dissection. And this is a slide that I've learned from the ESC guidance. When it comes to assessing the aortic root diameter, uh, and which patients would be referred for aortic root surgery. So I'm going to whisk quickly through that. So any patient who's got an aortic root diameter of more than 45 millimeters would be indicated for aortic root surgery in case they have another reason to go for, uh, for surgery. Uh, you can refer patients who are above the milli 50 millimeters to 54 if they have another associated history of dissection or unexplained family history of unexplained sudden death or dissection, or they have a rapid progression of the aortic dilatation, or they have systemic hypertension, associated coquitation, or it's a female who's seeking pregnancy. And it's a, uh, when it comes to uh, aortic root dilatation of more than 55 millimeters, 
it's a class one in the AHA and ECC guidelines, and it's class 2A in the ESC guidance to be referred for aortic root surgery, but we need to keep in mind, and that is in association with a bicuspid aortic valve. Um, last complication is palpitation of the aorta, which is associated with 20 or more percent of patients with bicuspid aortic valve. And there is an increased risk of death from aortic dissection, more than if it occurs with, if it's a on its own. So if you've got co-occultation of the aorta, along with a bicuspid aortic valve, you have a more increased risk of a dissection rather than a, a co-occultation of aorta on its own. And the whole pathology is regarded as a diffuse aortopathy associated with bicuspid aortic valve. Any comments or shall I proceed? Yes, yes, go, go ahead. We can comment at the end, I think. Okay, so uh, when it comes to diagnosis, uh, there was, um, diagnosis always been reliant on the detection of a cardiac murmur. And there was an extensive literature allowing to compare diagnostic characteristic of intonation, which is ultrasound, um, handheld echo versus auscultation for common valvular heart diseases. So which concluded that um, ultrasound or handheld echo without Doppler was superior to auscultation for detection of all regurgitant murmurs. However, there was no significant difference in the diagnostic ability of the two strategies for detection of aortic stenosis. So we believe that the uh, auscultation is as good as handheld echo without a Doppler in picking up AS. However, echo remains the key, not only for diagnosis AS and knowing the morphology, but also to illustrate the consequences and complications uh, of valvular disease on the cardiac function. So um, echocardiogram, this is the bare minimum, in my opinion, and I can see from uh, previous expert opinions, um, having morphology, gradient and area, LP size and function, both systolic and diastolic, as we believe diastolic function gets impaired initially, as well as the flow status. Um, I do appreciate that this slide might look busy and it might, might not project very well, but I think it's a very important slide to look at from the ESC guidance with regards to uh, valvular heart disease management in 2017, where we initially begin, as Dr. Abu Bakr said earlier, um, in case there is a discrepancy between the gradient or the velocity uh, with the valvular area, we assess the gradient. So if the gradient is set to be high as a maximum velocity of more than four, and a mean grade is more than 30, we need to exclude high, high flow status which can occur in certain diseases or certain conditions. So certain conditions that can cause high flow status is such as Paget's disease, anemia, thyroid toxicosis, and pregnancy. So if that is excluded, and we believe that these readings are, are correct, then we can say that this patient has got high gradient, severe AS. If the patient has low gradient, or you think that it doesn't, it doesn't run along with a, with a valve area that it, it, there is a discrepancy, then you need to exclude measurement errors in the first instance. And this is similar to what Dr. Abdurrahman has kindly suggested earlier, that you might have an error with your reading on the first instance. If you believe that your readings are correct, then you need to go for flow status. And flow status is defined as SVI or stroke volume index, which is, the, which is in essence, the amount of stroke volume in relation to the ejection fraction. And any, any flow of more than 35 is classed as normal, where low flow less than 35 is classed as low flow, high gradient AS. So if the patient has normal flow with low gradient and an area of less than one, then in that, in that occasion, severe AS is unlikely. However, if the patient has low flow, low gradient AS, we need to go further looking at the um, LV function. So if the patient has a LV function of less than 50, then that could be the reason for the low flow, and then you can try to reverse that using a dobutamine echo test. Um, so if you, try to reverse the, if you try to reverse the low flow and you do manage, then you, can, you, then you can do your reading at that point. But if there is no flow reserve or the patient has normal LV function, this is where 
diagnostic uncertainty persists and further investigations might be warranted. So this is another table proposed by the ESC guidance assisting the classification of aortic stenosis in patients with low, low gradient, low flow aortic stenosis with normal ejection fraction. Going back to our previous table, so when you have, when you have normal ejection fraction with low, with low flow, this is called paradoxical low flow, low gradient. And uh, I, I'm quite sure that uh, Abdurrahman, Dr. Abdurrahman Jamil would, uh, would uh, give us his expert opinion on, on these measurements and guidance. Um, okay. so, this is the proposed, so this is the proposed table. Uh, and it, it's given us uh, certain criteria that might assist us in deciding which category uh, we can categorize our valvular heart disease in. So keeping our, our case in mind, an elderly lady who's above the age of 70 with typical symptoms which could, we couldn't attribute to an, any other explanation. And from a qualitative uh, point of view, having LV hypertrophy equally not being attributed to something else along with a reduced LV longitudinal function um, and from a quantitative point of view, having a mean gradient which is on the higher side, along with an aortic valve area of less than 0.8, and an LV flow that could be measured by other modalities other than, other than Doppler techniques. And uh, in, most importantly, doing a calcium score for the aortic valve. Uh, so uh, having a calcium score in the aortic valve of more than 2,000 in men and more than 1,200 in women would guide towards the likelihood of being severe AS. So, uh, Muhammad, if you allow me. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, yeah. So I think our patient will fall in this, I mean, the category, okay? Uh, she has, she is an elderly lady. She has typical symptoms, which is uh, syncope or presyncope with shortness of breath. Uh, and we don't have uh, ob obvious uh, reasons for that, I guess. Uh, number one. Number two, she has, uh, I guess, severe LVH, again, small LV cavity. Uh, this will give you uh, a decrease, I mean, the preload, because there is, uh, for sure, the asteroid dysfunction, impaired, impaired feeling, and فَقَدْ الشَّيْءِ لَا يُعْطِيهِ زي ما قولهم. Okay, for, so there is a reduced preload, it definitely will lead to reduced cardiac output and low flow, uh, despite, the pre, uh, the, despite the normal ejection fraction, because you said her ejection fraction is more than 55, and she is exactly fall in this category. So I don't think uh, here, uh, that is why in this table you don't see the vitamin, okay, because this table only for patients with uh, sorry, go to the table, yeah, Muhammad. Okay, uh, go to the table. Next slide. Yes. So, uh, if you notice in this in this uh, table, this uh, this table is talking about the uh, low flow with normal ejection fraction, with preserved ejection fraction. Uh, that is why there is no role of the vitamin stress echo. I think in this uh, patient, but we can use other things like. Uh, the uh, calcium score, BMP, uh, MRI for fibrosis, and these things. Okay? And the other trick also, these patients also commonly they have high blood pressure. So the, the measurement of, and mentioning that, not only measurement, even mentioning and documenting the blood pressure uh, during the echo study is very, very important. Uh, because uh, if the blood pressure high, this will cause like high impedance on the flow. So this again will lead to paradoxical low flow. And even the, the uh, people, they tend to measure what called impedance, okay, to the, to the flow. This is one of the reasons of paradoxical low flow. So the, the right thing to do is to uh, correct the blood pressure, to lower the blood pressure, and then to uh, do the echo again with normal blood pressure to see whether this effect for the blood pressure or not. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdurrahman. I mean, this is a very nice uh, uh, expert opinion. 
Uh, so going so going back to our audience, we're trying to make this as interactive as possible. So how would we approach this lady next? Uh, so as as, doc, as Dr. Abdurrahman Jamil is suggested, we can go for further modalities or use uh, use other biomarkers. So uh, this is another table that was proposed that is proposed by the ESC in their guidance in 2017. So if we say that this lady has got severe AS, then the next step is to look at symptoms. So if the patient has got symptoms along with severe AS, then they would be for an intervention unless they have any comorbidity or general condition that makes any benefit unlikely. And in that case, medical therapy is indicated. However, otherwise, they would be referred for surgery if they're considered to be low risk with no other characteristics that favors TAVI. If they, have, they, they do have surgical risks, then they need to be referred carefully to a heart, heart team that makes individual uh, evaluation for technical suitability and risk benefit ratio. Having said that, a heart team is quite important involving different aspects of the healthcare sectors, involving a cardiothoracic surgeon, an interventional cardiologist, an imaging specialist, the referring cardiologist, cath lab, and anesthetist. So this is a team that makes individual uh, risk benefit for such interventions. If we say the patient is asymptomatic, then we need to assess the LV function. And if the LV function is poor, and that is said to be attributed to the aortic valve, then they would be a candidate for surgery. Otherwise, if the LV function is more, if LV function is more than 50%, then we would assess their physical activity. So if they're active, then we would send them for a treadmill test and get them to exercise and try to elicit any symptoms or drop in blood pressure. However, unfortunately, there is a good number of patients who are either physically inactive or elderly and cannot go for a treadmill test. And at that point, if they, have, they are physically inactive or there is no symptoms of falling, dropping blood pressure, then we need to look for risk factors and we need to look at individual surgical risk. And I want to point out this fact, this, this bit, because I think it's often overlooked because I think um, when we try to elicit risk factors, we should know that it's a class two indication for uh, referring someone for an intervention in asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis in the absence of any symptoms or dropping blood pressure with exercise, if you have any of the following. So you need to have very severe aortic stenosis defined as maximum velocity of more than 5.5 meters per second, or valve, severe valve specification and a rate of progression of the peak velocity as at more than 0.3 meters per second per year. Also elevated mark BMP. So BMP we think is a good biomarkers and as, as Dr. Abdurrahman has kindly said, and we're gonna come back to that later, and I think it's a good biomarker uh, for assessing prognosis in patients with severe asymptomatic um, uh, aortic stenosis. And eventually, severe pulmonary hypertension of more than 60 millimeters mercury confirmed by invasive measurements. So if you have any of these, it's a class 2A indication for referral to um, an intervention. Otherwise, if you haven't got any of these, then you can try to reevaluate and monitor patients. So having said that, uh, so uh, having said that, first of all, let's go to BMP. So we think BMP is of, a, um, is of great value in risk stratification and timing for intervention, particularly in asymptomatic uh, patients. And this was a study published at the BMJ Heart Journal uh, in 2018, where, where they've recruited, they've, they've screened two, th more than 3,800 patients, out of which eventually 387 patients were, uh, were put into three groups according to the BMP. So the first group had BMP of less than 100, second group less than, two, less than 200, and then carries on. So what they did is that they've cumulatively followed up these patients for five years to assess the incidence of AS-related events. And we, we, when we say AS-related events, we, we mean either death 
related to AS or heart failure hospitalization related to AS. And as you can see clearly, patients with lower BMP had lower incidence of AS related events. Uh, so they concluded that increased BMP was associated with a higher incidence of AS related adverse events in patients with asymptomatic severe AS with a normal LV function. And asymptomatic patients with a BMP of less than 100 who had a, had a relatively low rate and this, these patients could be safely followed up with watch and wait strategy. So in terms of monitoring, patients are monitored for progression of valvular disease or appearance of symptoms where physicians try to take the opportunity uh, to, uh, to catch patients before uh, a sharp decline in condition occurs with a decline in benefit um, from any intended intervention, along with a sharp rise and prevailing rise in risks. And, and in that occasion, uh, in that occasion uh, normally, prognosis tends to be quite poor. So yes, this is another, yeah, please Sorry. go ahead. Can you go back? Yes, uh, this one. Uh, so the, the, in, the, in the past, there is a saying of a very famous surgeon uh, that the common cause of death in asymptomatic severe aortic uh, stenosis, the commonest cause of death is cardiac surgery, the AVR, surgical AVR. This is in the past. But now, I mean, with the multi-imaging, uh, I mean, and these guidelines, uh, we used to, I mean, we discovered that a lot of these patients with severe asymptomatic AS, they are not, I mean, unified. They are not one group. Uh, it is a spectrum of, the, I mean, the, uh, the manifestations. Uh, first of all, First of all, we should not say the patient is asymptomatic, uh, just, uh, I mean, like this one, the statement. We should uh, say the patient is asymptomatic at rest, okay? Because all, I mean, most of these patients are uh, elderly, they have comorbidities, something like that. But the minute they subject, uh, or we subject them to stress, whether emotional or physical stress, immediately they will become uh, severely symptomatic. And the thing is, the fairest symptom of asymptomatic severe S could be sudden death. So it is very serious. And I will never forget an event happened in our hospital. This is a uh, 19 years old boy who has uh, homozygous familial hyperlipidemia, and he has severe aortic stenosis. He has zansomas and these zansomas in the, in the feet, uh, I mean, irritating him. He went to uh, like general surgeon or, or subedic surgeon, I think, uh, because are on the joints, big zansoma, preventing him from wearing his shoes. And the, this surgeon decided to do, to do for him minor surgery, excision of these zansomas. And he gave him, I think, uh, like moderate sedation. And this patient, unfortunately, became hypertensive and arrested immediately. And as a matter of fact, this patient, they don't tolerate uh, hypertension. Even simple vesivagal attack, they can kill them. And uh, that is why I always warn my students when they are examining uh, the, the patient, elderly patients with AS, they should never ever uh, palpate the carotid, uh, uh, I mean the arteries uh, simultaneously bilaterally. They should do it one at a time. So the, the, the message is that we should not say the patient is uh, asymptomatic uh, just like this, okay? Because this patient, so the, the, uh, we should at least stratify them by calcium score, BMP, MRI, if they can go to exercise, if they cannot do exercise, treadmill, uh, modified one even can do, or even just we can walk with them uh, uh, like few meters, okay, to see whether they are really asymptomatic or not. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jamil, um, for your guidance. 
Um, so going further, uh, so this is a recovery trial. It's quite a recent one. It was uh, made by Professor Kang from South Korea, and it was published in 2020 New England Journal of Medicine. Um, so what he did is that he compared early surgery versus conservative care for asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis. As we all know, timing and indication for surgical intervention in these patients has always been controversial. So what he did is that he did a prospective uh, multicenter randomized trial comparing the long-term outcome of early surgical intervention versus con conservative management in very severe AS. Uh, we need to concentrate on very severe because what they have um, classified very severe as an aortic valve area of more than point, less than 0.5 uh, uh, centimeters plus either a maximum velocity of more than 4.5 meter per second or a mean gradient of more than 50. So it is severe, very severe AS. So out of the 1,031 patients screened, there was 200, 273 patients who were asymptomatic indeed, and out of which 145 patients went for randomization. 122, 128 patients were excluded for the reason of being having low ejection fraction malignancy, mitral valve disease, severe AR, age more than 80, which I'm going to talk about later and has caused a lot of limitation to this study, um, in addition to having a positive exercise test and declining to participate. When we, when we go to the demographics and patient characteristics, we can see over here that patient's age was relatively low. So in the conservative group, it was 63 plus minus 1.1 and it was in the early AVR to 65 plus minus eight. Um, and they ha also had a low surgical risk score. And what we do here is, is we use the Euro two risk score. And I'm quite sure that a lot of uh, our colleagues would agree that this is the most widely used uh, risk score when it comes to surgical risk. Um, so when we come to echocardiography finding, we can agree that all of these uh, readings were ongoing with very severe. And we come to the cause, there is an increased incidence of patients having bicuspid valve, which could probably be attributed to the younger age of the cohort of patients uh, being found. So out of the 145, there were 73 patients who were randomized to early, uh, early uh, surgery, where there were 72 were randomized to conservative treatment. Out of the early surgery group, there were four who crossed over to the conventional, conventional arm, and there is two of the conventional arm who had early, early surgery. However, they were included with an intentional, intention to treat analysis. So as we can see over here, out of, out of the 72 patients who went for early surgery, uh, who, who were randomized for surgery, 71 had early surgery. And out of the 72 who were classed for conservative management, 53 had surgery during follow-up, which was more than six years. And in the first slide, they assessed as the primary endpoint, operative or cardiovascular risk. So on follow-up, they found the early surgery group had a 1.5 risk of op I had 1.5 incidence of operative or cardiovascular deaths at four and eight years respectively. And in the conservative group, it was 5.9 and 26.2 at four and eight years with a hazard ratio of 0.09 and it's had a, a low p-value of 0.003. In this second chart, we can also see that a secondary outcome, which was death from any cause, was also lower in the uh, early surgery group. However, this study had uh, quite a few limitations, out of which it had a small sample size with younger patients with the low operative risk and a higher incidence of bicuspid um, valve. And only selected patients had a uh, treadmill test would have other been, been an indication for a valve deep at surgery with patients having very severe, so the, it, they categorize patients into very severe. So uh, not, there wasn't any patient only having severe AS. That's why 
we don't think that this could be applied to early TAVI in patients with asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis. So uh, with regards to TAVI versus surgical repair, there are certain parameters that would make the patient in favor of either TAVI or surgery. Uh, with a patient characteristic of being older with significant comorbidity and a higher euro risk score with a favorable access for a TAVI. While for a surgical repair, patients tend to be younger with a, a low surgical risk score or suspected endocarditis and another reason for going for surgery. Having said that, in the last 10 years, TAVI have been trialed in high risk and inoperable patients. And as we can see in partner one uh, trials, and this has progressed further to, ass to assessing TAVI in intermediate risk patients. While currently we have a few studies such as the Notion and the core valve in patients who are at low risk. However, we need to know that TAVI does come with a risk which are needing a pacemaker, vascular complication, paravalvular leak, and durability has always been questionable. ESC guidance has always recommended surgical aortic valve repair as a gold standard treatment and less patients that deem high risk by the heart team. So in summary, we know that aortic valve disease is a common condition with poor outcome if treated, if, if untreated, especially in the elderly population. And bicuspid aortic valve has complication other than aortic stenosis, which we need to look for in, in, in echocardiography. Detection of symptoms could be difficult, especially if immobility in, is impaired, and that is in, in a good number of, pa of patients who are elderly. And when it comes to surveillance, it's a lot more than just valve area and gradient. And we have also had the chance to use certain biomarkers such as VMP. And nowadays there are a few trials trialing other modalities of uh, uh, imaging modalities to assess early uh, decompensation. With TAVI having ongoing, ongoing trials in all risk patients, however, durability has always been questionable. These are the references. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, and I hope that you allow me to present these live slides that are showing the devastating effects of the very recent floods occurring back home in Sudan. Uh, these floods just took the lives of more than 100 people and uh, left more than five, uh, 500,000 homeless uh, in one of the worst uh, disastrous uh, incidents in Sudan over the last uh, 100 years. And thank you very much for, for your listening. Okay. Uh, thank you, thank thank okay. you very Go much. Sorry? And yes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, do you have any comment? Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed Abdul Ghadir. Uh, that has been really very um, comprehensive, informative, and very educational. It was a fantastic talk. And uh, I, uh, uh, Dr. Abdurrahman uh, Jamil, uh, do you have any comments? Or yeah, just, just uh, thank you very much, uh, Mohammed. It's really very excellent uh, presentation. We refresh our knowledge about this very important uh, topic and uh, subject. Uh, just regarding the uh, bicuspid aortic valve, uh, uh, we uh, should not forget to check for coarctation as association. In patients with bicuspid aortic valve, the association of coarctation, as you correctly said, is 20 percent. But in the patients with coarctation of aorta, there is 60 percent chance to have bicuspid aortic valve. So uh, uh, this is this is one thing. The other thing, because the coarctation is very, very important, maybe uh, this is the only reason for severe LVH in some patients, okay? And we blame the bicuspid aortic valve, but the actual reason is bicuspid aortic valve. I remember also we have young patient, she went, uh, I mean, uh, she's following with us for a very, very long time until she went into severe cardiomyopathy, she has ejection fraction only 10 to 15%. And then at the end, one of our uh, uh, yani technician, uh, she discovered that this patient has coarctation. And the patient went for a corrective surgery for that one. 
uh, only after that when she recover her injection flash. This is one. The number two, uh, the uh, also is very common cause of endocarditis. We see a lot of patients with bicuspid aortic valve with uh, endocarditis. And the last thing about cart, I mean the bicuspid aortic valve. In diastole, we cannot differentiate between uh, bicuspid and tricuspid because both of them, they close, especially if there is a rafe, because both of them, they close in like Mercedes-Benz sign and trileaflet. But in, in systole, uh, we run it uh, frame by frame and we discovered that bicuspid aortic valve will open in ovoid shape, okay? So this is a very important also differentiating uh, uh, feature between bicuspid and trileaflet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdrahman Jamil, for the uh, comment. Any uh, further questions from the rest of the panel? Um, any questions from the audiences? I just had a question Thanks. earlier on about uh, the use of uh, the butamine during invasive uh, aortic valve. Uh, assessment, Abdurrahman Jamil. I don't know if you have any experience uh, in that. Sorry, sorry. Uh, again, the, the, the use. Assalamu alaikum, Abdurrahman. Hayakallah. The use of the butamine during yes. invasive aortic valve assessment. Um, do you do it in your labs at all, uh, or you only use it non-invasively? Non-invasively only. Non-invasively in in low in low. Uh, low flow, low gradient, when the ejection fraction is reduced. Uh, right. We, uh, separately, okay, in, in uh, non-invasive lab. Who, uh, we don't use it to uh, combine with the uh, invasive one. Invasive. Uh, regarding, mm -hmm. regarding the, I mean, use of the vitamin in paradoxical low flow, it is very controversial. Some people, they said this still there is, uh, I mean, like a uh, role. But I don't think, I personally, I don't think it is, we should use it in a preterm injection flash. Right. And then uh, the, the presence of low flow in, in normal ejection fraction, uh, yes. you nicely explained the different uh, forces working on uh, through the aortic valve and uh, cardiac output to result in normal flow or low flow. So yes. how, would you, how would you get low low, low cardiac output or low um, preload in aortic stenosis in the yeah. presence of normal function, normal LV yes, function. Yes, yeah. yeah. So the, the normal uh, ejection fraction doesn't mean anything because it is, uh, it is a fraction. It is uh, just a percentage. Uh, percentage of the stroke, the ejected volume uh, over the uh, end diastolic volume, the LV. Uh, so it doesn't mean anything, the ejection fraction. But the, the thing is, uh, any uh, condition leads to uh, decreased preload, uh, not only even, the, I mean, the diastolic dysfunction or severe LVH, even the mitral stenosis. Severe mitral stenosis will give you decreased preload, and this will lead to uh, underestimation of the gradient, number one. Number two, also the severe MR, okay? also will give you, uh, uh, l, l, I mean, the low flow. So any condition leads to reduce uh, preload because فقد الشيء لا يعطيه, okay? Uh, what what uh, the LV, what it receives, is what will give, okay? In the cardiac output. So uh, uh, any condition leads to reduce, I mean, reduce L uh, preload will lead to low flow. I hope I answered your question, yeah, Uba. Yeah, yes, yes, you have. You have answered it. Thank you very much, Abdurrahman. Yeah, very useful. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, any questions? Uh, if there's no further questions, then uh, I think we will come to the end uh, for this session. And uh, we will go for the next speaker. I'll hand the mic to Dr. Ablazim to introduce the next speaker. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Hint, and I would like to um, thank Dr. Mohamed Abdelgadi for his uh, excellent presentation. Uh, well done, congratulations. And many thanks also to Dr. Abdurrahman Jamil for your nice uh, comment. Uh, it was really helpful that this talk is covered a lot of uh, recent guidelines from 2020 with regard to TAVI and the recent also trial like recovery trials.